Who's got two thumbs and a zone system? Not me. It's this guy. That is Ansel Adams. And for those who don't know, he came up with, along with another bloke, the concept of the zone system. What it is and how it works and how you can use it developing your images in Darktable is the subject of this video. Let's get into it. Hi, and welcome to episode 31 of Understanding Darktable. A lot of stuff to cover at the tail end of this video, but right now, let's have a look at the zone system. Now, anyone who considers themselves a landscape photographer probably already knows the name Ansel Adams. He was an American photographer in the mid part of the 20th century and quite famous for his landscapes of Yosemite National Park and a bunch of the American Midwest. And a lot of his work was monochrome. However, the zone system doesn't have to be used on black and white images. There's an interesting side note. I saw somewhere in the email list through the week, someone made a reference to when we refer to monochrome and when we refer to black and white and them not necessarily being the same thing. Uh, I will confess to not knowing what the etiquette is there on when you refer to something as monochrome and when you refer to black and white. Uh, if you want to clue me up in the comments down below, go right ahead. But anyway, the zone system is, well, let's just look at it. I've grabbed a few images here from various trips, uh, a couple here from the overnight bike ride that James and I did back in August or September of last year. This was one just a roadside lookout and I knew I was going to need a little bit of fill flash so I put the flash on the camera took a test shot and there happened to be a woman who pulled up at the lookout at the same time as us so I got her to take a photo for me. As you can see I've just done a couple of basic things a crop and a retouch because there was a bit of a sun flare up here in the upper right hand corner of the image. So the zone system how does it work? Well We'll turn the module on and straight away we get a, I'm not going to say black and white, but certainly shades of grey uh, rendition of the image here. And we've got this series of boxes down below. Now, the Darktable user manual, if you look at the PDF version, which is available online at darktable.org, says that the zone system module defaults to 10 zones but as you can see it actually defaults to 8 at some point somewhere someone's changed the default to 8 but not updated the manual not that that's a massive deal but essentially what happens is the image is divided up into 8 zones which are essentially 6 shades of grey plus pure black and pure white and they are represented by these eight boxes. And you can see that as we mouse over them, we see which parts of the image are mapped into those eight zones. So as we get right up to the very brightest parts, we can see that that's just the highlight in the sky. As we come down, we start to see more of the mid-tones and the deeper shadows until we get all the way to black. So how does this work? Well, you'll see that as we mouse over these boxes, we get this little triangle following our mouse. And what that's allowing us to do is click and drag to either extend or compress that particular tonal range. So we might want to keep the blacks super black. So as we drag that down to the left, we're compressing the blacks really hard. And if you watch what's happening in the histogram up in the top right hand corner, you can see that the blacks are really being compressed. And we could do the same thing with the next deepest shadows. As we drag that across to the left, we can watch our histogram slowly building up on the left hand side. And at any point we can say, well, I want to lift out a bit of detail in our faces. Let's suppose I felt like our faces weren't exposed clearly enough. I could mouse over these bottom sections because you notice now that we've started dragging these things around, there is a division between the bottom half of this scale and the top half of the scale. 
The top half represents the output of the module. The bottom half represents the input to the module. So I can mouse over these until I see that our faces are lit up with the yellow highlight. So I know that our faces fall into this fourth zone. So if I wanted them to be lighter, I would simply grab the triangle to the right hand side and pull that to the right and that's lightening our faces. Now, I don't actually think that our faces need lightening, but I'm just wanting to demonstrate how you would use this in practice. So as we drag that more and more, we're bringing more of that particular tonal range up in value. It's almost like using the exposure module with a parametric mask, where you're saying, I only want to adjust this particular part of the image or that particular part of the image or that particular part of the exposure, you know, and I want to move that bit up or I want to move it down or whatever it was. When we get to the Q&A at the end of this episode, I'll come back and address that again. Okay, so that's one image. Let's, uh, let's just move on to this next image. So this was after our night at our little Airbnb at the little country town of Walka. And this is meant to be a river that flows through the middle of town. But as you can see, it's not actually flowing. It was just still water in a puddle at this point in time. It was a fairly cold morning, as Australian weather goes. I'm, you know, I'm sure my northern European viewers would laugh if I said, Cold? You call two degrees Celsius cold? Yeah, I know, I get it. But anyway, it was cold for us. And being on motorbikes in two degrees, yeah, that was chilly. So this was it, first thing in the morning. And once again, not done much. I've given a little bit of a tweak with the filmic module, but beyond that, this is pretty close to how it looks straight out of camera. Again, we will activate the module. And, you know, I might want to keep the darkest parts of the image quite dark so that I get some contrast, but I might want to open that. Yeah, no, maybe not. So I'm just going to bring that down a bit. Maybe the next zone up. Give that a little bit. Yeah, just to open up those shadows a little bit. Now, so far, all we've done is left this on its default eight zones. If you want more zones to play with, you can simply use your mouse wheel and as you drag it back towards you, you will get fewer and fewer zones to play with until you get to three. That's the minimum. And as you roll your mouse wheel away from you, you will get more zones. So you can split your tonal range up into smaller pigeonholes, if you like where you, you know you just narrow it down to much finer bands that you want to play with so i'm just going to leave it back where it was at around about eight zones and yeah that's just allowed me to open up those lower shadows but still keep deep shadows black so that i've got some contrast so if we turn the module off yeah just washes out a little bit that just gives it a little bit more punch but if I looked at this image and I thought, mm, although it's not clipped, maybe that sky is a little brighter than I want it to be, I could come up here to this second zone and I can see there's the majority of my sky. And I might just drag that down a bit just to darken the brighter parts of the sky. The beauty of this particular approach using the zone system module is that I can adjust just those brighter parts of the image without affecting any other part of the image. And again, as I'm going to talk about later in this episode, yes, you could achieve a similar result with other modules. This is just another way of doing it. All right, let's move on to the third image, which is actually the fourth one in this film strip. This was a nighttime shot that I shot down in Melbourne, in Victoria. Uh, again, this would have been about September of last year. And I chose this specifically because it's a nighttime shot. So naturally our tonal range is quite different to what we would look at with a daytime landscape shot. And by the way, you don't only have to use the zone system module on landscapes. Yes, you could certainly use it with portraiture if that was necessary. But I specifically chose this because it's a nighttime shot. So we look at this 
once again, pretty much straight out of camera, I just tweaked the white balance because I felt the white balance was a little bit warm. If we activate the zone system, again, we get our monochrome rendition here inside the module. And I can see that there's quite a lot of black in this image. And I'm just going to compress that down a little bit. And then I just want to open up some of the deeper shadows, but I don't want to make those bright parts any brighter. You know, I don't want this street to get lit up lighter than it already is. So I might compress some of this down and I can just open up those deeper shadows without opening up the blacks. So if we compare that, we've gone from what now appears to be a little bit washed out to something that has nice deep blacks. We've opened up the shadows a little bit, but we've not blown out the highlighted parts of the image. So that's a quick overview of the zone system module. Like I said, yes, you can achieve similar results with other modules, and we're gonna address that in some of the Q&A. I will put in the comments down below or in the description to this video, a link to the Wikipedia page on Ansel Adams and also a link to the sort of like a subsection of that page that talks about the zone system and the guy that he co-developed it with when they were teaching photography. Okay, a couple of other things to cover. Just this week, we have seen the release of the first dot release update to Darktable. Uh, as you will see from my screen, it's now 2.6.1. There were a couple of bug fixes released. I'm not going to claim to understand any of it, uh, but I will put that link in the description down below. So if you want to go and read up on what the updates entailed, go right ahead, knock yourself out. Now, I've made a couple of references earlier in this video to the fact that you know, what we were doing with the zone system, we could also have done with other modules. And I just want to read an email that came in through the week from Julian Rickards. Hi Bruce, I admire your YouTube videos on the use of Darktable and was wondering if you might take a request. I've never used Lightroom, so I don't know if it suffers from the same thing, but there are modules in Darktable that seem to offer different ways to do the same thing. What I'm wondering about is sharpness and contrast. There are sharpness and contrast modules, but there's also high and low pass filters and the equalizer. And there may be other modules related to these topics. How do they compare in terms of what they can do? One does X, but another does not, etc. Thanks, and I'll keep watching. I haven't seen all of them yet. Jules. Plus, I've got a couple of others. This was from Ben Rudgers or Rudgers. Thanks so much for the videos, Bruce. They're beyond awesome. Fill mode might be really useful with a parametric and or drawn masks and perhaps multiple instances of the retouch module. Similar thoughts about masks and instances with preserved chrominance in the filmic module. Powerful tools for fine grained expression, but easy to chop off a finger. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Again, thanks. It's incredibly helpful to have you share your thoughts on Darktable. It saved me many months of trial and error. Thanks, Ben. Glad you're enjoying them. Uh, this also from Guido Giadulo. Apologies if I've butchered that. Hi, Bruce. I've recently come across your channel and I love the Darktable tutorials. What I wanted to ask is this. I know that you can do one thing in different ways, like sharpen or denoise or color correction, but what is the trade-off with each method? Should you stick to only one method or can you stack them without any significant loss, like using color lookup tables and color zones at the same time? So there's been a few people asking the same kind of question, and it all pertains to this idea that there are multiple modules in Darktable that can do very similar things, and, you know, some of them not really the same approach, it's like a similar approach, but comes out with a similar or same result. And really, I've got to say to all of you, I don't think there's a blanket statement that I can make, A, with any accuracy or B, with any authority, 
as to which modules you should use or should not use or whether you use them in conjunction with each other or you just use one. My personal experience, and you know, I stress this is just me, it's, you know, it's subjective. In the two and a half years that I've been using Darktable, what I've come to understand is, yes, there's all these modules that can achieve similar results. And many of them have very different UI uh, design, you know. So it really comes down to what makes sense to you and what gives you the results that you're looking for in the image that you happen to be processing. I don't think there's a, a right and a wrong answer to this. I think it really just comes down to what works for you and what works for the image you, that you're working on. And, you know, I've certainly got modules that are my go-to modules that I use all the time. Uh, Filmic is definitely amongst my favorites these days. And, you know, I've expressed in the past that I'm not a huge fan of the base curve module because I feel like it overcooks highlights, particularly if you've been a little generous with your exposure. If you've, you know, I know we all try and live by that idea of push your histogram to the right, but what I've discovered, certainly with my old A850 and the way I used to shoot on that camera, I always did try to push the histogram to the right, and what I've found in Darktable is that the base curve can be just a little bit too aggressive, and it cooks the highlights, and so, you know, when I go back and I look at any of those images that I shot in the last 10 years, I have a tendency to want to undo the base curve and then, you know, maybe let Filmic handle everything because the Filmic module, to me, does a really nice job if you've turned off the base curve and you, you know, you're working with a raw image. I, I never shoot JPEG. So, you know, I think, yeah, all of this is to say I don't think there's a right and a wrong answer to any of these modules. It comes down to your own personal workflow what works for you. If any of the developers who are watching these videos have anything to add to that, please sing out down below. Love to keep the conversation going. Like I said, I'm only speaking from personal experience what I've realized out of my two and a half years with the program. And, you know, two and a half years is probably only a microcosm compared with some of the people who have been using it for a lot longer. So take from that what you will, guys. A couple of other comments that I saw through the week. One was from Bernd Schmidt, who said, Thank you very much. You speak very slow and clear so I can understand as a German everything. <laughs> Great, Bernd. Glad you are getting something from all of this. That's awesome. <laughs> the next one was from Pam Pam No Spam Ma'am. <laughs> Great username. <laughs> Oops, you left the base curve module active during your second filmic attempt. Smiley face. Yes, I did. My <laughs> apologies for that. Uh, next up, there was Boo Boo Lou Boo Goth. <laughs> I'm assuming that's how it's pronounced. Can you do a white balance episode? Explain, like, if the image is greenish, you need to lower this and up that, when to use tint or temperature. Okay, mate, I will put that on the list. Full Monty, in response to episode 30, said, Really nice video, Bruce. Have spent more time watching than doing. But in the past couple of weeks, I've changed that. Must say that mucking around with an image after watching your tutorials has actually helped me develop a surprising comfort level and proficiency that's enjoyable. Learning how to manage masks has been the biggest challenge. This HDR video only makes me want to try more of the various modules to become familiar with them. Thanks for all your hard work. No worries, Monty. Again, relating to episode 30, Paul Christensen said, A very informational video, Bruce, but all you did was show that someone could putz around for hours to come up with an inferior HDR image in Darktable. Darktable is excellent for many aspects of photo editing, but HDR is not one of them. My time is valuable, so it's worth the money to me to buy Aurora HDR and get image alignment, deghosting, chromatic aberration adjustment, perfect saturation and contrast in seconds with just one click. Mate, 
Fair enough. No argument. I don't know Aurora, and maybe I was putzing around. I don't know if you're criticizing me or Darktable, but uh, fair call. Uh, if there are other tools, yeah, by all means, use other tools. Before I finish that thought, I'll move on to Christian Zick, who said, I think HDR workflow in Darktable is very much inferior to most other programs, especially as it doesn't seem to align images, nor does it do deghosting and auto-toning. But this is still another great video. Well, thank you, Christian. And... VU Bat, I, I'm not sure how to pronounce this. Hi Bruce, there's some interesting results with the global tone mapping module, different modes, on single exposure photos, not HDR stacks. You know you can boost the exposure over 3 EV, all you have to do is enter the number you want via the keyboard. Beats adding new instances. Great channel and tutorials. Well, thank you, I did not know about that. So, with regards to other tools, yep, definitely. There's probably other tools that are better suited to some of these tasks. And one of the questions that got asked in the comments was, why didn't I cover Hugen? Or Huggen? Or Hugen? I have no idea how that's meant to be pronounced either. And as I said in the comments to episode 30, the reason... Well, there were two reasons why I didn't go there. One, although I've dabbled with Hugen, I don't understand the alignment process well enough to explain it coherently to someone new to the app. Uh, and I will just add to that, I understand the basics, but there's quite an in-depth understanding required to really know how to use the control points properly. And I haven't developed a deep enough understanding of that just yet. And my second point was, this series of videos is about Darktable, and I don't want to dilute the content. More than likely, when I've had a bit more experience with Hugen, I'll create a separate channel for Hugen tutorials. And that's pretty much the way I feel. I don't know about you, but I find it frustrating that, you know, I'll go and find a channel on YouTube that purports to be, you know, tutorials about software X, and then suddenly amongst all their videos, I'm finding a video about software Y. Now, okay, yeah, sure, I don't need to watch that video if I don't want to. But sometimes people will do that within a video that's meant to be about software X, and suddenly they're talking about software Y. It's like, no, I came here to learn about X. If I wanted to learn about why, I would search for tutorials on software why. So that's kind of my mindset on this. When I understand Hugen to the depth and breadth that I feel is necessary to create tutorials on it, then I will start a separate channel and I'll do some Hugen tutorials. But right now, I don't feel like I've got enough of an understanding. I understand the basics, but I don't feel like I understand it deep enough uh, to do it justice, and so I won't go there until I do. That's just me. Oh, I almost forgot. I was going to talk about one other image, which was this image here, and this was sort of a follow-up to the episode on local contrast. One of the things that I forgot to mention in that episode was that in the manual it says if you're processing black and white images or monochrome images, whatever the correct terminology is, feel free to be a little more heavy-handed with the local contrast because it gives the image some real pop. And I've got to say, I've recently reprocessed this image. This was a close-up of a steam train in Borneo and using black and white processing which I always imagined for this image and then using the local contrast module and being reasonably aggressive with it uh, in this particular instance 200% just gave it the really nice gritty high contrasty kind of look so just wanted to add that in I know it's sort of a little bit disjointed and it's no longer tied to that particular episode, but just wanted to throw that in for anyone that's following along through all the episodes. If you are processing black and white, feel free to be a little bit more aggressive with that detail slider in the local contrast module because on black and white images, it really does give them that sort of nice contrasty black and white look. All right, people, I think that will do it for this episode. Have fun with the zone system module. 
and again it's just another way of altering the tonal distribution or exposure of your image and yes there are multiple ways you could achieve similar results have fun with all of them and i'll see you in the next one